All right, let's do this. Um, welcome everyone to this webinar uh, where we're gonna be discussing the Istio Ambient Project and more specifically how to contribute uh, to it. So I'm really excited about this. I'm joined with Jeremy and uh, he's gonna be sharing kind of all his trials and, and tribulations as he's been contributing to the Istio Ambient Project. So uh, we think this is gonna be great content and there's also a demo involved. So it's just not us talking. I think Jeremy's gonna do some hands-on stuff and, and show off uh, some things that he's been working on. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and do a quick introduction. Um, my name is Phil Gibson. I'm a senior product manager here at Microsoft uh, in our open source org. And I work with the likes of Jeremy and uh, the other uh, OSS team here that is uh, working around service mesh. And uh, with that, Jeremy, tell us about yourself. Yeah, so yeah, my name is Jeremy Morris. Um, I'm a software engineer on the Upstream Service Mesh team. I joined back in May. Um, before I worked at Microsoft, I worked at a company called DigitalOcean. It's a smaller cloud provider. I worked on their managed Kubernetes product, um, some container registry stuff, a little bit of uh, billing as well. And before that, I worked at a few other companies like Raytheon and, and uh, an advertising agency called Publicis. But I have like a, a wide array of experience, but as of uh, late, like the past few years, I've been really trying to like narrow in on distributed systems and get really good at that. You know, my first exposure to that was really Kubernetes in terms of like big, complex distributed systems. And over time, as I gained more experience in that, I wanted to like learn other ones. And that's where Istio came up. Um, an opportunity came up on this team to work on open source full time. And it was still in the cloud native, like Kubernetes container space. So it seemed like a perfect opportunity. So here I am. Awesome. Yeah, we're happy to have you aboard and, and, and working with us on this. All right, so let's get into it. We're talking Istio Ambient. But before we jump into that, let's just give some quick uh, community updates in the service mesh world. Uh, as you know, if you've been living under a rock for like the last year, you may not know any of this stuff, but um, today we're gonna be talking about Istio Ambient, and this is a new mode of uh, architecture and in operations with Istio. Uh, and this was announced uh, last year, uh, in April, uh, 2022. And, uh, and then also uh, this year in July, uh, Istio has become a graduated CNCF project. So it's met all the criteria, it, it's battle tested and uh, people like it. So again, congrats to uh, ACO for making that graduation. Uh, last, uh, I wanna talk about the Open Service Mesh project. So uh, as those may know, uh, this was a project that was uh, heavily contributed by Microsoft. And uh, since the introduction of Istio into the CNCF uh, community, uh, we have decided to join forces with the Istio project and therefore we have archived uh, the OSM project as well. So uh, thanks for all of those who supported uh, OSM. Uh, but uh, if you are now looking for a new service mesh, uh, there's uh, several under the CNCF uh, umbrella. We're gonna be talking specifically about the Istio, but uh, please do your due diligence and test out a service mesh that may be appropriate for your needs. All right, so that's service mesh updates in the community. Uh, next, let's talk about uh, the dust has settled on the KubeCon North America in Chicago, uh, the greatest city uh, in the world. Uh, tons of great people come from there. Wink, wink. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I want to highlight uh, personally, and, and if you were out there and, and met me, it was it was great to see you. Uh, and if not, I hope to see you at the next one. Uh, but um, I found to me, a couple of uh, sessions that really were, were uh, I guess, impactful for me. Um, the first one here is uh, the past, the present, and future of Istio, and that's with our friends over there uh, at, at Google, John Howard, as well as uh, Lewis uh, with Solo. Um, this is a great session that really talks about the whole evolution of, of Istio. So uh, if you are, looking to understand Istio and kind of want to know uh, some of the, the tribal knowledge uh, through the years. This is a, a great session to, uh, to go and, and, and view. Um, this next session is actually with a team member of ours, uh, Jackie Elliott, 
Uh, it's not service mesh specific, but uh, what she does is she talks about the fundamentals of PKI. And as you know, uh, PKI is a huge component in service mesh, how authentication happens. So uh, if you just want to kind of understand, hey, what is this P PKI stuff about? How does uh, these MTLS handshakes work? Uh, I thought Jackie did an excellent job of really kind of like boiling this down for anyone to kind of consume. Uh, and then this last one, I, my, my hat's off to uh, Keith for putting this together. Um, this is probably one of the best sessions that I've experienced at any KubeCon that I've gone to, and I've, I've been to several. Uh, but this is the Service Mesh Battle Scars session. And uh, I'm not going to give this away, but look, we got representation from Google, Solo, Isovalent, and Buoyant talking about uh, their projects, their products around Service Mesh. And, um, it gets a little chippy. That's all I'm going to say. So I'm going to leave you in suspense about that. Check it out. It is it is great. And I hope to see more sessions like that to where uh, in a technology stack, we can get kind of that diversity of all the projects. And then people talk about, you know, the pros and cons and then other people and other projects can kind of uh, ask questions toward those other projects as well. So Great session. Please check that one out. All right. So with that, let's get into Istio Ambient. And uh, this is a hot topic. It's red hot. And, and for those that don't know, um, Istio Ambient uh, basically takes the sidecar out of the pod. And so, you know, just as some context in standard mode or just kind of like the original architecture of Istio, uh, you have uh, kind of what's being displayed here, which is uh, you're going to have your application that's going to be in a pod. And then traditionally, we will deploy a proxy next to it. Um, we uh, use the Envoy proxy here. And then uh, all the communications that originate from your application or transverse through the sidecar proxy. And then that's where like you got your control plane that's doing all the programming of uh, what it's allowed to talk to, what policies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, this has been pretty much the, the architecture for, for a long time. And, you know, it's it's debatable, but what people are saying is uh, this in, in this, in a, in a large deployment, you just have this proliferation of a ton of sidecars that can, uh, eat at resources on your cluster. So with that Istio, they introduce what they're calling ambient mode. And so you'll see what was done was the proxy sidecar was taken out of the pod and put on the actual node itself. And so you'll see here that's depicted as the Z tunnel. And so now your application hop will go to the node proxy and then that node proxy will then relay that communication over to uh, either uh, you know the other nodes proxy, uh, where it will then find the service that you're you're looking for, and this is all done at, at layer four for the Z tunnel. And uh, so the next question is, okay, well, what if I got you know layer seven policies? I got like some API, some particular path that I want to you know either uh, you know restrict or you know put some type of you know controls around. Uh, they answer that with what is known as the waypoint proxy. So uh, what you see here is if you do have your layer seven policies, uh, you'll still hit your Z tunnel that's local on the node. Uh, but then if there's a policy for you to only be able to get to a certain path of a service, then that is will transverse through the waypoint proxy. It will then validate if you can talk to this particular service at this particular path. And then if everything checks yes, then it'll it'll pass you on to that. Um, so uh, Jeremy, please come over top and correct anything <laughs> that I might have stated there. Um, and then you know maybe talk about you know how you've gotten into this whole new architecture and then kind of all the things that you've been working on uh, with Istio Ambient. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when I joined the team, just a little context, uh, and this relates back to what. Phil mentioned in regards to archiving OSM. I joined the team when the team was just getting into like really ramping up on contributing to Istio. 
before then, uh, of course, there was contributions being made and involvement within the community, but a lot of it was internal as related to OSM. With it being archived, a lot of the focus has transitioned to, you know, having a team that just really focuses on our participation in the community. So when I said that there's an opportunity to work on open source full time, I was like one of the first people to, you know, from the outside, join the team and, and, and be a part of that. A lot of the uh, other folks on the team were already on the team when OSM was the main focus. So they went through the experience of transitioning from focusing on internal stuff to focusing mostly on external. I came in as like the first, I guess, like purely externally focused hire. And now the whole team does that. So that's, that's been a pretty cool experience to, you know, if you're a software engineer and you uh, join a new team, there's always a, a transition or at least I experienced this of going from some type of legacy, either process or project to a, a newer, you know, more exciting thing. In this case, it's not, you know, just going from product to product It's literally just like, not even just, it is our entire like model of how we work as engineers is going from working on something internal, internally facing to an externally facing thing where you're collaborating with a bunch of different other companies. It's a whole new experience, a whole new culture, and we're still learning and improving on that. But I think that the progress that has been made since I joined the past like six or seven months has been really like cool to see and experience. Before I joined this team or before I joined Microsoft, I uh, didn't get a chance to work in open source full time. I had to do it all outside of work. All those Kubernetes contributions that I've done um, were typically at night hours or like, you know, weekends and things like that, trying to find ways to bring it into my day job. Entirely different situation here. You know, my day job is contributing to open source. So it's been a bit of a learning curve, surprisingly, even though I really like contributing to open source, just the whole like political aspect of trying to even just get PRs in has been a, a really great uh, learning experience. You know, there's a, you know, there's a mention of battle scars as a, you know, a topic for a uh, you know, panel discussion. I, I think that, you know, there's a ton of battle scars to be talked about here too. So maybe I'll do something like that in the future, but um, yeah, yeah, my yeah. focus initially when I joined the team was uh, Z-Tunnel actually. Um, when I first joined, I think that there's like little Rust experience. You know, we still don't know a whole lot of Rust. It's a, it's a hard language to learn. But when I first joined, one of my tasks, tasks were to get like ramped up on Z-Tunnel, on Ambient in general, learn um, learn Rust to be able to contribute to Z-Tunnel. And I started working on, working on that. And some of my first contributions were like little things like, you know, this log filtering doesn't work as, work as expected. It's actually not allowing you to add different filtering levels. So I had to learn what, the log, what a log level was, what a log filter was. What does that even mean? And what does that mean in the context of Istio and Ambient and Z-Tunnel? So I went through that process of learning that, made some PRs to fix that. So that was a cool, like, you know, cool small wins I could get yeah, as yeah. a new contributor. As I progressed through that, shared my knowledge with the team. We also had an intern on the team as well that was also doing Rust work. So we'd like, you know, share our experiences with one another, uh, talk about it as a team and like kind of leverage other people's experiences to grow as a team. That's something that's big, I think, um, or the strategy we're taking as a, a team that's getting into a community that's dominated by other companies. You try to like grow together. So if I'm working on this area, whether it be Z tunnel or maybe it's waypoint proxy stuff, which we'll talk about soon, you try to gather as much information along the way through your learning process as you can. And then you share it in like, you know, uh, some succinct uh, form with your team so that they can also gain the knowledge that you've gained, hopefully, or at least some of it. So that's kind of like the strategy we, we approach with that. And now that, that's, that's fun, but it's also hard, you know, it, <laughs> coming from a team where like everyone else was like experts and they've been working on this product for X amount of years to now a team where everyone's brand new, including myself. It's, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, you know, as, as a company, Microsoft, uh, we definitely have made the investment to work with Istio and you, you being part of that investment as well. Um, it's, it's interesting to hear like your, your, your take on it. Um, I, I'm just curious, like, you know, for those who are looking to, you know, when they look at Istio and it, and it is a massive like code based project, right? Tons of stuff everywhere, right? Um, and so those who don't come with, you know, I'll keep using this, this term, but the tribal knowledge, uh, just just curious from you, like, and obviously you, you're thrust in here, you have a clear objective to actually work on this project, but what would you say was like the number one, like, I wouldn't say obstacle, but 
something that you had to overcome to really get like you know into the project and, and get things moving for you yeah i would say that the the whole structure of how you can communicate and and get work to flow through you know from yeah. ideation all the way to it's merged into the code base and being released with a specific version that that took some getting used to and i'm still getting used to that and i think we're making improvements as a team and and i'm making improvements myself but it's not the same as working on like you know when i worked on the kubernetes product at DigitalOcean, it was very easy to say like okay my current uh you know project is to improve you know maybe the way uh, resources are associated for a cluster you know like nodes and uh load balancers and volume snapshots volumes that's another thing i feel like i'm already forgetting some things <laughs> from my previous job that's how it goes in there but like all those different resources that belong to a cluster they're backed by some services that are owned by different teams they're all in the same company so what do i do i reach out to that lead that manager that product manager of that team and then i get collaboration that way like hey you know say phil's a, a product manager of the firewalls team i could reach out to him and say like hey I'm trying to uh, add a firewall controller. It's going to interact with your service. Does uh, is there like any rate limiting I should worry about or anything like that? And then we can collaborate and get the right solution out there. Right. In Istio or in the open source world, it's not as straightforward as that. I'm I'm not reaching out on some internal chat. I'm reaching out over reach out over a Slack channel or uh, a working group meeting or you know maybe a GitHub uh, comment comment on a PR or uh, you know an issue that was created. And I'm trying to collaborate that way. And that, that's all you can really do to reach them. You know, you can't really bother their manager or anything like that. You're hoping that the engineer that you think will get back to you at some point. So the best way, I think, to deal with that obstacle, you know, the communication aspect, is to make your initial communication as compelling as possible. What do I mean by that? I think that just like, and I apply this to a lot of things I do, like when I go to ask a question, for example, of something I'm stuck on, you try to give as much information to the person you're asking for help or whatever it is, you're trying to set them up to be able to answer your question as best as possible. If you just go in with like a vague request, like, hey, I'm stuck here, or hey, I would like to work on this random feature, you give no extra information such as a design doc, reasoning for this, uh, uh, adding this feature. Why are you actually reaching out to this specific person? Like, what do they have to offer that you decide to reach out to them for this particular question you have? I try to have all those things, like it's like a little mental checklist. Right. Try to have all that stuff, you know, uh, ready to go so that the person, when they look at it, they see I put the effort. I feel like people are more willing to put the effort into answering my question that way. Yeah. And that's how I try to collaborate. And I find that, like, even with PRs, you know, my descriptions, probably all my PRs aren't like perfect, but I try my best to fill it out in detail. And then the people that I tag, I, I try to like write why I tag them and politely ask for the review of a doc or a PR. I usually get pretty quick uh, feedback. And you should also remember, I think, when it comes to open source, that we're all sharing this code together, right? It's not a personal thing when someone rejects your RFC. You know, that one of the first right. things I wrote for Istio was uh, allow per pod DNS settings. I had to learn what that meant and, uh, you know, read like some specs. I got all excited because I was going to be able to implement something from a spec, which is apparently a pretty common thing that I Lucy learned, um, had an idea that, you know, a lot of technologies were based off of specs and research papers, but I didn't really understand like to what, uh, like how often that happens, I guess. Right. So a few times we're, we're looking at like gateway API specs, we're looking at this DNS policy spec in Kubernetes and seeing how that could apply to being translated to Istio. That, that's a pretty cool experience. So I was really pumped about this per pod DNS setting thing. Someone else from another company made the issue. They said they needed help and I'm trying to like, you know, be helpful so I can get, you know, some report built here and be able to work on like, you know, other things that I might want to work on in the future with the help of the people I helped in the past. So, yeah. uh, you know, very excited. I picked this up, right? The RFC, he looks at it. He's like, oh, I think this makes sense. But funny enough, you know, people make issues and, and things in Istio. It doesn't mean they know all the information. So the person who made the issue has some questions uh, or some confusion too, even after I dove in and said, maybe Jeremy, you might know the most at this point about this, let's bring it to the broader community. So after going back and forth with that original person and finding out that, you know, we need the broader community's uh, perspective on this because, you know, kind of gone as far as I could go in terms of my own research, that's when I brought it to the working group meeting. And it's at that point that it was like, oh yeah, Jeremy, this is great. 
but it's actually not the work you want to do right now to get him into data. So yeah, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes that happens. But yeah. I think the, the biggest lesson I learned here is that it's not personal. At the end of the day, we're trying to build what's best for both the community and, you know, the, yeah, the community. You know, that includes all the maintainers and contributors, but of course, the actual users. And if you think about it in that perspective, we're all just working together. We're all, we're all one big team. And when I get rejected on that, I just eagerly take on the next thing. And, you know, you just move forward and keep on tackling the next thing, the next thing, asking for help. And I think people also like that persistence and consistency. Yeah. So, you know, as you get better and improve upon uh, your selection of issues that actually matter, you'll find that things start going to quick. Like there's plenty of PRs where I'm like, wow, that actually got approved as soon as I put it up. You know, that, that's happened a few times. There's obviously somewhere I get tons of comments and it doesn't <laughs> move as I thought it would. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I think, like kind of like separating uh, or disambiguating that whole experience of attaching your emotions to the work that you're doing. You know, it's good to be pumped up about it, but don't feel bad if it gets rejected. Everyone's yeah. ideas get rejected, PRs get rejected. There's also a bunch that will go through if you keep at it. Yeah, I think you, you touched on what, what I think is like the, the biggest like uh, cultural shift to be aware of when you have historically been in a, an enterprise or, or corporate environment, and then you want to now go and work in the open source, like just uh, the different paths and, and avenues for things to get done like like this this and you mentioned it so it's not like you know when you're in a corp and you need something by maybe another group or another individual uh sometimes you can pull that manager card you can say hey look i i've been waiting on this to be done uh, i'm gonna escalate i'm gonna cc the met guys manager the person's manager and then hopefully you know that that lights a fire and then you know we can move a little more expeditiously uh but yeah in the world of open source where uh, you don't have those kind of corporate alignments and, and org charts and things. Um, and you're, you're dealing with, uh, you know, kind of like the, what would we say, like the, the committee, uh, you know, the, you know, the overall committee of the, of the project. Uh, and then things like you mentioned, like now it's, it's not email, it's, it's, it's Slack messages and it's, it's going back and forth on, on issues and, and things of that nature. So, uh, so for those who are stepping into this world, just, just be prepared. It's a, a different experience um, uh, in working in open source, but, uh, but a fun experience too, once you get things rolling. So don't want to just <laughs> not encourage people to do it, uh, but just be prepared that uh, things are done a little different in the open source world world and 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 for good intentions too right um so no that, that's awesome uh and i think that's really valuable for people to hear like your firsthand take on your approach into to istio and this this specific project um now let's 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 see some stuff do we, do we got a demo yeah, can, can you show some things see. off for us yeah, so um, actually somewhat recently there was a uh, update to the documentation for getting started with Ambient. So I figured I can go through some of that uh, as part of the demo. Yeah. Essentially, uh, just a little context. One of the things I got to work on recently was um, working with my team to add target ref, uh, a field that basically allows you to set a policy target reference for a particular gateway or a waypoint of proxy. And we've done it for a few uh, CRDs. Can, can you break that down a little more? Because I know yeah. if, if some yeah. people aren't close to this, that like like target ref, like what, yeah, yeah, what yeah. is he going on about? Like, so can, can you kind of explain that in a little more detail as far as like, you know, what's the value of, of target ref, et cetera? Yeah, so it was the case before that you would have to basically target your workload or, you know, you use the workload selector model to basically apply it to specific like namespaces or a cluster or, or what have you by leveraging labels. All right. right. Now, this new way is uh, you can target the gateway by using um, this target ref field and that's set within the policy itself. So when you go to apply a policy to your cluster, there's four that we've updated authorization policy, telemetry, WASM plugin, request authentication. You can now specify within that spec a target ref field that specifies a specific gateway that that policy applies to. So this would be that waypoint proxy. And there's a lot of benefits to this down the line. Um, you know, a lot of reasons why we want to do this. 
But I, I think uh, one of the reasons, if I remember correctly, is uh, having layer, tar layer targeted authorization. And there's a few other RFCs out there that will benefit from this new way of selecting workloads, but our workload selection. But I think this was uh, pretty cool because this was the first time our team got to collaborate together. We had an RFC that someone on our team wrote. I took the lead from there and started making tickets and working with the rest of the folks on the team to figure out how to get the work done. And then we just got it done, got it released in 1.20, I believe. And that whole process, that was, that's our first time going through like ideation. This is the RFC that was created, presented to the working group, approved on. When I say approved, you got to get, so you see some people here like Lin Sun, you have Eric, uh, John Howard, uh, Louis, there's some other people here at Mitch Connors. You know, all these people are like, like the big head honchos when it comes to, you know, Istio uh, progression of like, you know, features or uh, ambient progress we're trying to make. They say yay or nay to a lot of things that we work on. So getting approval from them, that was a big first step. Once we did that, now it's actually uh, time to implement it. So I took the uh, initiative of volunteering to make the tickets and like, try to treat it like a typical internal product experience I was used to. <laughs> right. You know, uh, yeah, it's kind of like a wild west sometimes. Sometimes you'll see in Istio people are just making PRs without a ticket with it or RFC. I did not want to be like this. So I wanted to tie everything to an umbrella issue and call that our project level issue. That's a uh, an idea or a, a way of thinking that I shared with the team from my last job. You have your project level issue and then underneath that is all your different uh, tickets that will help you implement and achieve that, you know, complete the issue essentially. So once we did that, we were able to break out the, the tickets for specific policies as to what needs to be done to update those. We also had to have some work done. Jackie worked on this, Jackie Elliott, the one we presented earlier that I shared the link for. She yeah. worked on actually updating the proto definition. So if people aren't familiar, you probably understand what a REST API looks like, uh, you know, the typical like JSON stuff or, uh, yep. you know, like gets and all yep. that stuff. Post all, your, all your verbs. All yep. Yep. Yeah, you need yep. to automatically <laughs> make that uh, available to the callers in your code, right? And there's like some API stuff that happens. Well, the gRPC is also for APIs, but it's uh, done through, uh, I think it's called a protocol buffer. Yep. Um, yeah, Probably and this, this is supposed to be a more like efficient way of exchanging data. And at my last job, a lot of those gRPC uh, calls were happening internally. So we sped it up by using gRPC. And then the external stuff that was called by front end uh, applications would be done through REST. In this case, I'm assuming that you know the communication happening internal within Istio is also being done through Protobuf because it's you know more efficient. So we have to update the gRPC uh, endpoints that matter for this particular change. And in this case, the definition, the proto definitions that define what a policy looks like, that needs to be updated with target ref. And it was a little interesting, the back and forth on that. It seems like a small thing to just add a field, and I'll get to that in a second, what target ref looks like um, in a spec. But to add that particular thing, there's a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of thought behind like what policies we should add this new field to, how uh, it should be like, I guess, put together within the code and and like, you know, like what is the abstracted, uh, I guess you can think of this as like an abstraction. And when you have, uh, I don't get stuck on words here, I'll have to cut some of that out, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the, the biggest thing that I'm, I'm pulling from that is it going back to like the different, uh, you know, the, the difference in culture from like, you know, traditional enterprise in, in open source. And, and one thing that you're talking about is, because I guess, you know, me as a, a product manager, uh, when I've talked to customers, uh, one of the biggest things that I'll hear from kind of someone who's in the enterprise environment is, hey, we, we need this feature. Can this open source project get this feature? And then I'll, I'll return to them and I'll say, OK, yeah, you, you want that feature? Create an issue. Go. <laughs> and so that's like a new concept for a lot of people when they're working with open source. It's like, um, it's not like a traditional like ISV that, that you got a contract with. Uh, and, and so what you were showing is, hey, you wanted to either enhance something and you took the initiative to kind of, you know, do the RFC, start to present it to, you know, everyone uh, who 
what we'll call like the, the gatekeepers, so to speak, of the project. And then really like drive that, you know, all the way through to uh, it getting actually merged into, into the project. Well, just just to be clear, uh, Keith did the, the RFC. But another thing to know, I didn't point this out. We, we did the RFC initially and there were some assumptions that were made. I don't remember the exact details, but uh, there's that's just how it works. I mean, whenever you work yeah. on and work in tech, right? You, you make some assumptions based on the data that you have at the moment. But in open source, or especially Istio, there's a lot of context, a lot of context we don't have. And I remember Jackie's first PR to update the Perl definitions, uh, those policies that have the target graph. There's a lot of assumptions that were made that were quickly addressed by the maintainers that we didn't think about or write in the RFC. So that was also interesting. And that's something we kind of retroed on, like you know, having a more uh, filled out RFC in the sense that you know we try to like think of even more edge cases that we're not aware of, I guess. Yeah. So, there's different things with, you know, the UX, you know, the user experience that we didn't initially think of uh, or, or other things that were in flight that might affect what we were working on. That stuff came to light once we made the PRs. So that that's, you know, you, you try to avoid that. You try to avoid that by making like good tickets and, and, you know, get the approval for the actual proposal. But even the maintainers might not know at that time until the implementation starts happening. Yeah. For us, I feel like the proposal went pretty quickly. And then we started like just pushing out PRs and then all these questions started popping up. <laughs> yeah, once things start getting a little more tangible, oh, yeah. you know, that's like, oh, okay, what's going on? <laughs> all right. Well, I have my uh, terminal up. I wanted to show the Yeah, let's let's go ahead. Let's 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 jump into it. Cause uh and then uh I'll ask, can you any way you can increase your font so it kind of just shows good on, on the yeah. video? Should be able to let's see. Oh, that's that's better. Not sure why. Let's copy paste something. I'm not sure why I can't. Uh, is, is it really bad? Let's see. Maybe if I make this. No, I think, I think it's doable, but anytime you can make it. But it, yeah, let's, let's not waste too much time if, if you can. Uh, okay. like that. Yeah, yeah, so, let, yeah, talk to us. What, what, what you doing here? What, what's happening? Yeah, so uh, here's an example of one of those four that we updated, one of those policies. This is an authorization policy. So if you're going to you know, hit a specific, uh, it's like, there's a book info application that is like canonically used in the SEO documentation. Yep. This book info app has like some different pages for viewing, uh, you know, different books and things. If you want to access that, you know, as just like an everyday person, um, behind the scenes, there's usually some authorization that's happening. You know, maybe uh, a specific page is only for admins. So you can only post it, uh, post to it or delete things if you're an admin. The authorization policy is going to enforce that. Right. You apply this policy to your cluster, and essentially, uh, you know, in this case, we'll target a gateway. Everything that's going through that gateway is going to align with whatever the policy rules are. And if you look at this, there's a couple different sections. We have target ref, we have the action, and we have the rules. The rules are telling you, uh, like, what what we're trying to affect here, I guess, right? That, that's one way to look at it. So in this case, there's a, a sleep service that's running, a service account. And then we have this gateway service account. So we want the rules uh, of this authorization policy to apply to those things. And then the operation or the methods that we care about in this particular policy are get. And we want to allow want to allow them. So that's what the action is. So we want to allow get requests uh, for these particular service accounts. And the uh, the gateway here defined is something that we'll add later on. This is a policy that I've saved locally so I can apply it and not have to rewrite it, but we're going to have to create this gateway. If the gateway's not there, when you apply this policy, it won't work. So that's that's what we're going to go through. We're going to go through the you know steps to make our cluster an ambient cluster. We're going to install the gateway CRDs, do the necessary steps to uh, set up the book info project on there, and then we're going to add this authorization policy. We're going to do a check before. We're going to hit those endpoints, add the policy, and then do checks after to see that we're being blocked on certain things, like you know maybe a post or delete. And, and that will be the, the demo. So we, right now we have, I have a cluster up already to, uh, is it bad if I use like, if I go like this and use like the uh, shortened? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So right now we just have a typical uh, kind cluster set up. I do this. Those are my nodes. So I have three nodes, uh, it's control plane node and two worker nodes. And this is actually, 
how they recommend you set it up, right out of the documentation. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. And there's a link that will be at the end of this uh, presentation that you can use to follow the same steps that I'm doing to get this set up. So let's um, let me look at my notes. So the next thing you want to do is install the gateway CRD. So we have this cluster up, just a normal, local, kind uh, Kubernetes cluster. For people who don't know, kind is a, a tool that you can use locally to run or set up Kubernetes clusters for testing and playing around with things. So we have this cluster set up. Let's add the gateway CRDs. So you do that, it's a big kind of ugly command, but uh, we add this because apparently, and this this is something I've noticed with Ambient 2 as a new contributor. There's a lot of little, like, not a lot, but there's some gotchas that you have to like know. And I think Istio does a great job of documenting this, but like, not all clusters apparently have gateway CRDs installed or, or guaranteed to have that. And if you miss this step, you might get stuck because it's saying we don't understand what spec target ref is because it doesn't have the appropriate, uh, like essentially that proto uh, definition that was updated. It might not be updated for your cluster. So we got to make sure it is. Um, and then all these uh, CRDs are updated and created. Now we should be able to install Istio. So we haven't done that yet. And actually let's look at, we look at the pods that are there now, right? There's no Z tunnel or anything like that, or Istio D. But once we install Istio, we're gonna see all those things pop up. Okay. Um, and actually, when you go to install Istio too, you gotta make sure to set the profile to be ambient if you want it to be an ambient cluster, which I do, so I'm gonna do that. Yeah, so you see that's processing the resources for the COD Z tunnel. It's also adding daemon sets, so we'll check those too and, and verify that the pods in the daemon set has been updated accordingly. So this takes a few seconds. So you said, hey, um, I'm installing the SDO. I have to set the profile to be ambient, and that's what's going to enable like the Z tunnel and, <clears throat> and then allow to have those, those waypoints to um, do layer seven policies. Um, can I still do the normal stuff when I'm in this ambient profile? If I don't want to traverse my traffic through the Z tunnel, can I still use the traditional sidecar in this, or do I need to install a, 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 this on a different cluster with that? That that's, that's a good question. I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, to my understanding, there's some things you can do. So, I think I think the goal is to have it be close to the experience of Istio. So like if you're an Istio right. user right now and you're trying to transition to Ambient, I don't I don't think there's there should be a huge difference, but there might be some things that you can do with the sidecar stuff that you can't do in Ambient or vice versa. I just don't right. know off the top of my head to be honest. But I know that there's a lot of discussion in the community about what kind of experience do we want ambient users to have? Does it need to be the exact same thing as what we have with legacy, we'll call it legacy Istio. Maybe that's not accurate, but we'll say legacy Istio or sidecar Istio. There's a lot of people saying that, no, it shouldn't be the same exact thing. And there's also some opinions about some things need to be carried forward. So it really depends on like what kind of things you're doing, I guess. Right. I just don't know all the, all the different use cases. So that, that's another thing too. As far as like being an open source contributor, you don't have to be an expert operation like person, right? Like I'm not, uh, an expert at operating Istio. That's not my my day job. Never has been. Before I joined, I never really even knew much. I didn't know much about Istio before I joined. I never operated it, never used it really. Um, when I joined the team, that wasn't a prerequisite for contributing. It, it never is in most uh, things, right? Even for Kubernetes. I started contributing to Kubernetes before I actually really used it. So I think that it's something to keep in mind. <laughs> That's actually a, a really uh, cool point to, to point out is I think what keeps a lot of people from, you know, getting into open source is they feel like they need to be level 500 before they can even do anything, you know. Uh, but yeah, from, from your experience, you're like, hey, I you know, knew of it and just started dabbling with it and bam, I'm, I'm a contributor, you know, so. It's not as scary as, as people think out there that you need to be an expert in, in the project before you can start uh, assisting it. 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, just real quick for context, I'm, I'm applying the sample YAML files that exist to make it so that book info comes up as an app yep. uh, for, for the cluster. So this is something that the documentation will reference a lot, this book info app. Cool thing about SEO2 that I, uh, as I talk, I'll try to talk, but the cool thing I notice is with the documentation, when there is documentation, it's pretty thorough. And it has like usually cool examples or pretty straightforward ones that you can use. It's pretty consistent across the board. So if you want to learn a new like topic or component within Istio, you can look at the documentation, follow their steps and, and private it yourself. Break things, not do things correctly, learn that way. That's, that's how I've been doing that. So, yeah. And in fact, uh, that's also another way you can contribute. I think I actually updated some docs and, and those pages are out there as well. Exactly. So if you look, you see that the service accounts have been added. Yep. We have all these things, right? And now let's, uh, the next thing we need to do is deploy an ingress gateway so you can access the book info app from outside the cluster. It's another big uh, command that I'm not going to type. Uh, paste okay. in here. It's a sed command. I'm not an expert with sed, but it does some stuff. And now that's updated, has been applied, that particular gateway YAML. And next, we need to actually set some environment variables. If you don't set gateway host and gateway service account, things don't work properly. So we need to make sure to set that. So I'm going to paste that in there. And there, there's some waiting that it wants us to do. There's a condition in the gateway called programs. Mm -hmm. We'll look at that in a second. I'm not 100% sure exactly how that works or why that matters. I wanted to look into that. Actually, we have Azure Report of Learning Day today, so maybe I'll spend time learning that. But it's important for us to wait for that to be finished, apparently. So that's what we'll do. We'll look at the gateway stuff after this finishes. Uh, you can just do, I think it's K or kubectl get gtw. I think it stands for gateway. Uh, that's a short one. So we can look at that and see what gateways are there. Okay, so can you see? That's your waypoint there, right? gateway. Yep. Program false. Again, I'm not, I think the documentation might get more detail. Not too sure why it recommends waiting on that condition. But let's see if we can, maybe there'll be an error later on in the thing we can try to figure it out. So <laughs> let's uh, move on to the next thing. Uh, now we can test that our uh, uh, our book info app is working with or without the gateway. We can do these uh, commands. So we're just gonna kind of curl to that endpoint. Yeah, right? and specifically we're going to uh, specify the service account that or the deployment that we're currently from, right? So we have uh, we're going to exec into the deploy sleep or the sleep one, and we're yep. going to make a curl command from there. And we'll also do it for not sleep, which is another one that we have up. And we're going to make sure that the communication is happening as expected. Grep. So this grep command is just to uh, get the title that's there. Yeah, we're going to filter uh -huh. out the uh, HTML coming back to you. HTML is not my forte, really, but there you go. It is showing up a simple big bookstore app. That yep. is uh, correct. And then we can do the same thing. So without the, we could do without the gateway host added there. Do it like this. It's a client page. And so this, if I'm following this right, that, that should fail or is that going to work? This should work. Okay. Work Even right without with gateway specified. That? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So now, um, once we verify that, this is, again, this is before we've applied the authorization policy, before we... Gotcha. Okay. Um, you know, we didn't add, we didn't even add the application ambient yet. So that's the next step. We need to add the application ambient by labeling. Uh, basically, it says you can enable all pods in a given namespace to be part of ambient mesh by simply labeling labeling the namespace. That's what documentation says. So that's what we're right. doing. Okay. Now, 
I think it says to send test traffic. This one uh, is a little weird to me. I think the reason why it's, we'll do it, but I think the reason why it says that is because there's a step in there, which we're not going to do. So I'm using the VM. I'm not too sure how to surface it, but there's a, a an application or a, a tool you can use called Kiali and like Prometheus. You can use these things together to visualize like the network stuff going right. on, right? Yep. Seems really cool, but I couldn't figure yeah. out how to get it to like, so you do it through localhost and all this stuff, but I'm running on a, an Azure VM. I'm like, I feel like the past few months, I'm just now learning how to use Azure properly, but I haven't learned enough yet to be able to show, uh, you know, something that's running on here locally in my browser or something like that. I'm sure it's an easy way to do it. I just have to spend time figuring that out. So we're going to skip that step for using Kiali and Prometheus, but I think that's something you should explore if you are able to do so. Um, I think we, we can actually skip that send traffic part. Now, we can allow the sleep and gateway service accounts to call the product page service. I'm going to copy something and paste it in here, and we'll talk about that. But we're setting the policy now, right? Yeah, so this policy that's being set is without the paragraph, okay? This is okay. Um, just a basic authorization policy to allow the, the list of service accounts there to be able to communicate with uh, the book info app as expected. But that policy is not prohibiting any like no, no, no. It's, S7, anything yet, right? Yeah. No. Okay. So now we can call the product page service from those uh, sleeping gateway service accounts. And then we can confirm that some things will succeed and some will fail. The things that will succeed are the, the sleep service account, right? That's gonna be able to communicate as expected. But if you notice, we don't have not sleep here as a service account, right? So right. we go to make a request, it's actually gonna fail and it should do so because it was not authorized to make that request. And there's a specific error code that we should be looking out for. I think it's uh, yeah, error code 56. It's failing because of that, I believe. So just copy that in there. This is similar to what we did before, gateway host, product page, it works, should work because we authorized it to. Right. Here's another one, right? Now let's do it with the not sleep. It should fail. See? Yep. It doesn't work. Okay. Now, here we go. Finally, to the thing that I was able to work on with my team the waypoint proxy. We need to deploy a waypoint, waypoint proxy for the product page service. To do that, we use uh, something called experimental. I think that's. Yeah, it's, so Istio CTL X is the experimental stuff that you can get access to by specifying that initially. So the point stuff is experimental directly because we're still trying to get any of the data. So that's where it lives. And then we could do like this. Oh, um, actually, let's. So before we do this, just for context. I think we talked about this before, but this target ref, this is the thing that's referencing. Okay. Got it. The book info product page, the name of the gateway. There it is. We're making it right now. So that, that's how that ties in. If you're wondering Got before, it. like, oh, where, where is it? Where's book info product page uh, of kind gateway? Where does that come from? We're doing it right now. So this is actually how we're making the gate. We're going to make the gateway and then have an authorization policy target it. It's as simple as that. So now we go back over here on this. Okay. By the way, I think it might have been this step or it might have been the gateway YAML part before. I'm not sure. But I think if we don't install the gateway, gateway CRDs, it's, it's around this point in time or a little bit before where it's like complaining like, oh, I don't know what's, I think it might have been here. I don't know what spec target ref is. And that's because the CRDs aren't like there to, you know, it's not mapping correctly because they right, don't. Right, right. So I, I think that's how it broke last time I did it. So watch out for that. If you get some weird issue where the spec target ref field isn't recognized as an actual field, it doesn't know what to do with it, it might be because your CRDs, gateway CRDs aren't installed for your cluster. So let's move on to the next thing. Now that that's there. Oh, and now you can see that the, okay, here we go. Yeah, so that waypoint proxy status should be set to true or, or programmed should be set to true. So we looked at that before. Let's see that. Oh, not that. I think you could just do that. This is what yeah, we're... you were just listing it out, right? There you go. 
Yeah, here we go. Yep. Yeah. That, I mean, you could look at it. You could go like this. Just grab for, I think, program maybe. Or uh, something like that. Yeah, see? You can see that's program true. You can see it's you true. Can, uh, yep. spec. You can also just do the, you know, get the gateways for all new spaces. Or and, and true means that it has a policy, right? Okay. Okay. Is that? I'm asking you, right? True means that it's 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 processing a policy going. I think through. I think so. That that sounds okay. reasonable. I, again, I don't 100 know for some reason right off the top of my head what exactly that means, but that sounds reasonable. Okay. It sounds like maybe it's being leveraged or something like that. I will look this up though. Yeah, we'll, we'll follow up on that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, again, you know, being new to the project, you don't need to know every single thing to be able to be productive and contribute. You know, I've Merge PRs for Z Tunnel, um, this target ref stuff for overall ambient, um, stuff for like core Istio. And my operational knowledge is probably worse than a lot of the, of the people viewing it right now. And I'm still able to contribute. So don't let that just <laughs> no, that, that, I, I like that. And, and I like just the honesty behind that because, again, I think what prohibits a lot of people from jumping into open source is they're like, hey, I, I'm not expert. Like, you know, people are going to laugh at me if I post a question or uh, people don't like the way I code or, you know, et cetera. But uh, I, I like that you're, you're just being really candid about, hey, uh, I think that's how it works, but, you know, I'm, I'm doing this other thing and, and, and I've no had point. stuff merged and so on and so forth, you know. Yeah, there's, there's um, no point in not, like, you, so I think Microsoft has a thing called growth mindset. And it sounds a little corny to, like, mention it, being out of work at Microsoft, but, like, that's something I always think about. You need to kind of go into it with the mindset that you're not going to know everything. You might be the dumbest one in the room, but that's where you want to be. You want to be in a situation where you're having to grow and learn to get to the level of the other people in the room. If you're in a situation where you know the most, it's time to find a new room. And that's like how I apply. Uh, I apply that to life in a lot of different things, but especially work. If I want to grow as an engineer, I need to be uncomfortable, be comfortable with being uncomfortable. You need to right. be in a situation where you're constantly having to learn and, oh, I don't know exactly what programs true or false means let me go now it's something else to look up and then you notice over time like you're build, building a knowledge map right you're yeah diving in diving back out diving in diving back out and you do this over time and that's how you get to be an expert there's no shortcuts no one is born just knowing istio or kubernetes that's a little silly right you have to go through right. and the struggles those battle scars what have you you need to make some projects that stink and don't work correctly you need to deal with customers getting upset with certain things working at a subpar yeah. level and then you need to improve on it and learn from those experiences and the next thing you know now you're building like i don't know flawless uh istio abstractions for your company because you're so good at it now but it takes time to get there yeah it's a journey <laughs> but let, let's let's apply while we talk let's apply this uh authorization policy and then we'll test out it's an effect and that that will be the the demo let me just awesome and then um yeah when we close this out obviously uh this demo that you ran through, uh, this is document. So we're going to share the link. So if people want to basically walk through what you just represented here and uh, looks like you, let's see, that is. Is that all working? I, I see the, the output there. I think I lost your, your audio there. Oh, okay. Oh, Sorry. there you go. Yeah. So I was saying that there's an unknown field here, and I thought that was when there was a CRD issue, but that's not, it doesn't seem to be the case. I'm trying to see what, let's see. Unknown field, spent that time with ref. And what should we see? Like, if this is working correctly, what should be the, the output that, that we would see? Yeah, so I just want to basically verify, like, if we do this command, for example, that because we only allowed... Uh, We're basically going into that sleep app and then just curling back to... Where is this? Hmm. This might be from the previous, let's see. I'm 
just referencing my notes and I'm gonna look at the documentation too to see what I missed here. Hey, doing live demos. That's what happens. <laughs> so that works. Hmm. Well, I'll tell you what, like let's let's kind of wrap it up. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me. I know that um you're following what's what's been posted and we can kind of come back and, and, and figure that out. So uh as we close this out, um, and hopefully everyone has has seen this 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 journey that you've gone through, Jeremy. So I I appreciate. It. I think this is really beneficial to the community so that they can really see like the day to day the process of someone who wants to uh, approach a project and start to contribute. And I really appreciate again just you being candid and and and. You know, I wouldn't say vulnerable, but just really showing like, hey, this is this is what it is, right? Like, am I expert in, in this particular thing? No. Uh, but, you know, did I spend enough time to ramp up on these particular things and, and got things into the code base? Yes. And and I think that, that that's huge. And by the way, I just want to point out too, like this experience of me not, I guess, like I'm following the documentation. It's not working as expected. Yeah. Or the day to day. That this is it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no. I understand, <laughs> I understand why it's not working. Maybe something I did, but maybe it might be an opportunity to fix the documentation too. Uh, yeah, yeah. We can do. Yeah. Like, go through the docs. If you're finding things that aren't working, you're trying over and over again. Make an issue or make a PR. Bring it up in the Slack channel. Ask like, hey, is this supposed to work? And there's sometimes you'll find out like, oh, actually, it doesn't work on my end either. Go ahead and make that PR, Jeremy. <laughs> so, right, right. I yeah, I think a, a lot of times, you know, you have these really sanitized uh, sessions of things, but hey, we, we went live. You know, we, we're doing this as, as you would do. Uh, but yeah, so but to close it out, um, you know, hey, how do you get involved in, in Ambient? Uh, just the things that, that Jeremy is showing you here, what he's working on. Uh, there's actually a uh, drive Ambient to uh, Ambient Mesh to beta. Uh, there's a Google Doc out there. Uh, please go view that. That is tracking kind of all the dialogue and, and all the conversations that uh, the community has been having around, you know, which features we're prioritizing, which components uh, are working, et cetera. Uh, so that's a great place to kind of really understand uh, where we're at with the project. Um, and then also, uh, please join the weekly uh, Istio contributor meeting. Uh, this happens every Wednesday, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern, uh, 10 a.m. Uh, specific. Pacific, sorry. Um, and then that's the meeting number there. And then you can also find this on the actual uh, ICO uh, GitHub repo. Uh, and then lastly, hey, here's the link that Jeremy was going through, uh, getting started with Ambient. There you're going to find a ton of content on what is Ambient. Uh, it goes really into detail about the pictures that we showed, the whole architecture. And then there's a demo to kind of get you to understand uh, what this whole Ambient mode it's all about. So uh, with that, we want to thank everyone who uh, stayed the course with us. <laughs> I know this went long, but uh, hopefully, um, you know, Jeremy sharing his experience uh, is, has been uh, beneficial and also insightful for you as you uh, embark on your, your journey. Uh, and so uh, again, thank you all. Uh, anything else, Jeremy, any last thing that you may want to share with us? Yeah, uh, I think that I just want to add to the attending the work, working group meeting. Uh, yeah. piece. I feel like, you know, the community is still, so yeah, the community's still trying to get better at like, documenting things and, and making things more transparent. You know, it's, a, it's not obviously not Kubernetes size, so it, it takes time to get to that level of maturity. I think that it's still at a point where a lot of the information and context that you would need to have to be able to contribute better can be found during those meetings. Yeah, find, like these little side conversations or historical contexts that aren't documented anywhere that you'll, you'll learn about in the meeting. So if you want to just sit by, be a fine wall and just listen, there's no obligation to talk or anything. You just sit there and listen and learn. Uh, you'll learn a lot. And also, if you have any questions about uh, contributing things, you know, whether it be, hey, I'm, I'm just a new contributor. I'm not sure where to start. I try following these things. I'm getting stuck. You can post that in the agenda for the meeting in the contributors. Uh, Slack channel for Istio as well. And um, yeah, any proposals that you have would also go through that working group meeting. You just add it to the agenda list. Anyone could add to it, request to add to it. 
and then you'd be part of that meeting and start contributing like that would be yeah no, I, yeah anyone can get involved anyway I, I think you nailed it i think you know the very first step is to show up at a meeting like whether you got anything to say but just join meetings hear the conversation kind of understand and then after a while that's that's going to help you I, you know there's so many times uh, again, going back to me being a product manager and people asking, hey, can we get this feature? And I'll say, hey, create a, an issue and, you know, put that issue on the meeting docs and say, hey, I, I want this to be an agenda topic. Whether, you know, it's just for you to kind of learn and have people talk to you about it. But, you know, again, just having that initiative to get involved is, is an awesome first step, uh, you know, for any, any open source project. So uh, with that, Again, thank you for everyone who <laughs> hung out with us for this <laughs> long time. Uh, again, I hope this was uh, beneficial to you all. And um, yeah, I, Jeremy, we, we got to do this again. So let's let's create a series. You know, maybe we could just follow your whole journey uh, through this thing. You know, yeah, it's fun. It's fun. <laughs> all right, thanks everyone, and uh, we will see you all later. Take care. Yeah, thanks.